On a warm afternoon in 1998, the Martinez family arrived at the Parnell Ranch outside of Auburn, California, to help out a relative and spend an afternoon relaxing and enjoying each other's company. Their pleasant Sunday would end with the brutal slaying of most of the family, including two small children, as well as the rape and beating of their mother. We will look at the terrible events of July 12th, 1998, and the monster that destroyed the family that had called him friend and shocked the entire state. On this episode of California True Crime, Arturo Juarez Suarez and the Martinez Family Murders. Welcome to this episode of California True Crime. I'm Charles, and I'll be leading us through this case of the Martinez family murders and the trial of their killer, Arturo Juarez Suarez. And with me, as always, are Jessica and Sean. How are you guys today? I'm good. Yeah, doing good. This is a case that was well covered in the Sacramento area during the initial search for the murderer, as well as the trial following the crime. However, it will be covered in a lot more detail in local papers, and those stories in the Sacramento area will then be picked up by the Associated Press and other newspapers throughout the state. So in the initial research, we, I, we saw a lot of these stories being reprinted, um, almost in some cases word for word, from the original sources and from the Sacramento area newspapers. Now, for me, I hadn't actually heard about this case uh, uh, too much. I, I remember real briefly when Suarez was actually captured. Had you guys heard about this case before? Uh, yeah, a little bit here and there, but not in the detail that I know you've, you've looked up. I can't say that I have. I think I would remember hearing Arturo Juarez Suarez and kind of remembering that. I, I haven't heard of this at all. Yeah, and considering the crimes that we're going to talk about, uh, it was it was surprising that it it wasn't more widely widely covered. As always, a complete works cited page will be able to be found on our website, CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. The majority of the research for this episode came from uh, the newspapers of the time, as well as court documents that we were able to obtain. I do want to take a moment to thank our Patreon supporters. Those don- whose donations have allowed us to gather more research materials that we might not have been able to get otherwise. We want to thank them for their continued support. If you'd like to support us and uh, or the show, you can go to our website, CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. Click on the link to become a Patreon supporter. Their help really does allow us to do a lot more in-depth research and, and get materials, like I said earlier, that we may not have otherwise been able to. So uh, a huge thank you goes out to them. Before we get into any more of the case, we do want to warn you that the facts of this case, like a lot of the ones that we cover, are disturbing, and in this case will involve the death of two small children, as well as a brutal rape. If you feel that you're not able to listen, we understand. You might want to consider skipping this episode, come back to another, or uh, download one of our older cases and listen to those. The majority of this case will center around Auburn, California, and uh, I think, Sean, you have some information for us about Auburn. Yeah, Auburn is part of the Sacramento metropolitan area, but it's about thirty minute dri- It's about a thirty minute drive north of the city of Sacramento. It's in the heart of California's gold country and is listed as California State Historical Site. It boasted a population around eleven thousand in the late nineties. It's still right in the middle between Sacramento and uh, Reno, Nevada, along Highway eighty. I like to stop there. They have Max's. It's one of my favorite restaurants, and uh, I can get. Uh, Really expensive Reuben sandwich, but it's worth it. Uh, what I was pretty excited about Auburn, California, is that it's the birthplace of Kane Hoder, which if you are a fan of horror movies, his name is familiar. If you're not a fan of horror movies, um, he is the most famous of the actors that portrayed the Jason Voorhees in the Friday the 13th franchise. So if you're not familiar with the Friday the 13th franchise, um, do yourself a favor and watch the originals. Um, but it, it, he's the hockey mask 
machete wielding killer. The other kind of famous son of Auburn, California is Clark Ashton Smith, who was one of the big three of Weird Tales magazines during the pulp era of fiction. So we're talking like the early part of the 20th century. Um, he was a famous, what they call weird fiction writer, along with H.P. Lovecraft, who created the Cthulhu mythos, and Robert Howard, who was the creator of the Conan saga. And, and there's actually a small monument to Clark Ashton Smith in an older part of Auburn in the historical center of town. But nothing for Kane Hoder yet. So I'm hoping that maybe Auburn will uh, dedicate a small plaque to uh, one of my favorite character actors. Also, for the listeners of this podcast, Joseph D'Angelo actually lived here for a while, the East Area Rapist and Golden State Killer. He lived there while he was uh, working at the Placer County Sheriff's Department, and that's when the Sacramento attacks were going on. Uh, Jessica, there is something that I know that you're pretty into in Auburn. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's home to a man named Dr. Kenneth H. Fox, who actually passed away, I believe, in 2020. I first kind of drove through here and saw these just giant sculptures, all different kinds of sculptures, um, some that look like they belong in a Wonder Woman movie, just all kinds of amazing ones. And when I looked it up, they were created by this man who lived there. He was a dentist. And they're actually all over kind of the Sacramento area. And they're just, I'll put some pictures up on our site because they are amazing. And I'd never heard of them before. And you're just driving and suddenly there's just a huge, looks like almost a Greek sculpture there. And he would keep them in front of his uh, residence. And then some, some cities, I believe, paid for him to make some for their cities. I believe there was some anger about them because, off, you know, sculptures often have nudity and that kind of thing. So some parents didn't like them and things like that. But they're really fascinating to see just in the middle of the Sacramento region. And Fox, we'll put some more information up on our website and, and – um and on our California True Crime blog too, because he's he himself is a pretty interesting character. But the sculptures are done out of concrete, which I was super interested to see. And we found a few photos of like him in midst of the creation. So it's a wire frame, and then him coating them in like con like sidewalk concrete. The Martinez family is a lot like other families in the Central Valley and foothills of California. Their livelihood centers around the agriculture industry. Jose Martinez, the father, uh, was currently, at the time, living in Galt, California. He lives in Galt there with his wife, Yolanda, their five-year-old son, Jake, and their three-year-old daughter, Ariel. The family also lives together with Jose's brother, Juan. Juan and Jose were agriculture workers in the area. There's no record of the work they actually did, but it seems that from reading some of the accounts, and what was reported in the newspapers that they were what would be classified as general farm la labor as, uh, as well as truck drivers. If you're familiar with the agriculture industry, you know that there's uh, when you work on farms or ranches, everyone kind of has to be a jack of all trades. And it seems like Juan and Jose were, were two guys. They would be able to do whatever the job required. Yolanda would state later that Jose was trying to save money in order to go into business for himself and was driving truck at the time of his death. On the weekends, they would often go up to Auburn, California to spend time with Jose and Juan's brother-in-law, Arturo Juarez Suarez, who at this time was living and working on the Parnell Cattle and Horse Ranch in, outside of Auburn, California. Now, the Parnell Ranch was a large cattle and horse ranch that was owned by Jack Parnell, who uh, was a former U.S. Deputy Secretary of Agriculture under George H.W. Bush, as well as the Secretary of California Department of Food and Agriculture, and also had been a director of the California Department of Fish and Game uh, even before that. He was also the owner and publisher of the cattle, California Cattleman Magazine, which if you're not familiar with this, is a really big kind of publication in California. It's a magazine that centers around the cattle industry. It's, it's predominantly for, um, well, well, exactly that, uh, people who raise cattle who are looking for um, breeding stock and things like that. Uh, I, I, my father was a cattleman, and I do remember as a little kid, you know, like flipping through the pages, and it's, it is an interesting publication. At the time of the crime in 1998, Arturo Juarez Suarez, who is often just called Sh Suarez, uh, was a seasonal worker at the ranch. He lived on the ranch in a trailer and worked six days a week, most often taking Sundays off. 
Suarez had married his wife, Isabel, and would have a daughter in 1990. Isabel would eventually give birth to their second daughter in 1992. The family would live in the United States for a while, but Isabel would eventually return to Mexico in 1995, where she was born. She would state later that she was experiencing unspecified medical problems. Suarez would continue to send money back and would visit his family when he was able to from time to time. Isabel would say later in 1998 she would ask for a separation because she was jealous, but he would not agree. I couldn't find any record of what she's jealous of. I think it's pretty safe to speculate that he might have been cheating on her or she might have been uh, afraid of the fact of like that long a separation, but there was nothing, nothing definite. And she did ask for a separation, but he said no. So he did continue to send money though, even though she said, I, I want to separate, uh, he will still send money home to both his uh, wife and his parents as well. They would stay married, but she would eventually testify at his trial that he would experience headaches and sleeplessness. He would also obtain medicine for these conditions in 1998, but no direct diagnosis was offered. No doctor came forward and said, oh yes, I prescribed these medications for this particular reason. So whether that was he went to the doctor and got something over the counter, or whether he actually did seek uh, a doctor's prescription for harder medicines, that was never released. Yeah, it sounds like it's more of just like you go to the doctor and they say, ah, try this. And then that's probably all, it, all that came about. Right. The story of what happened on July 12th, 1998, really starts on the 4th of July of that same year. It seems that the Martinez family had decided to go to a last-minute trip to San Francisco. Jose, Yolanda, Juan, and the two kids would all pile into the family car and head to the city to celebrate the holiday. It seems they did not call Suarez about their trip. It's not clear whether or not there was a prior plan to go all together. It seems as though the family had decided to go and then just went. When they returned home to Galt, Suarez, as well as a friend of his by the name of Ernesto Orozco, were at the Martinez home. Suarez, it it would be later testified by Yolanda at trial, was upset that the family had not been able to call him before they left for the city. Now, Ernesto Orozco would testify that he had not noticed really any problems at all, but he would say that on the drive there that he had commented to uh, Suarez about the Parnell Ranch being a really nice place, to which Suarez would reply, quote, you're way off. One can go crazy there by yourself, unquote. Again, to set the stage, the family goes to San Francisco. They have a good time. They come home. Suarez and his friend are there. Late in the evenings, they hang out. It seems like uh, from testimony that they actually stay the night there uh, in Galt before they leave to come back to Auburn the next day. And before leaving the next day, Suarez makes a plan with uh, the Martinez family that the very next weekend, Jose will come up, uh, will bring the family, and they're going to loan him their uh, car so that Suarez can go down to Sacramento for an appointment at the immigration office. Uh, just because there's a lot of people, if if I just want to try to get this correct, so... Jose Martinez is married to Yolanda, who they have kids, Jake and Ariel, and they live in Galt. Juan is Jose's brother. And then Arturo, who lives at the Parnell Ranch in Auburn, is Juan and Jose's brother-in-law. And then there's also a guy named Ernesto, who is Arturo's friend. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So is, is, so uh, Suarez's wife, Isabel, is Juan and Jose's sister. So, yeah, Isabel, she is married to Arturo, but she, uh, she's back in Mexico, so she's not really part of the story right now, right? No, uh, she will testify at, the, at his trial um, more as a, sort of a character witness, I think, more than anything else. Um, the defense will call her as a, as a way of trying to explain his actions. So, before leaving the next day, Suarez makes plans with Jose for that next weekend. 
The Martinez family planned to pick Suarez up from the Parnell Ranch on Sunday, July 12th. They're going to loan him their car because he has to attend an immigration appointment on Monday, July 13th. Now, normally Suarez takes Sunday off. He'd actually talk to his bar- boss, Jack Parnell, and he said, well, I'll work Sunday if you give me Monday the, thir- Monday the 13th off so I can make this appointment. And Parnell was fine with that. Uh, it's also important to, to mention that that the family was relatively close. So the Martinez family spent a lot of time up at the Parnell Ranch. So, you know, the family coming up to spend a Sunday and hang out while while Arturo uh, was working was not that was not that odd. Something else we want to bring up is that by this point, there's not been a, a history of bad blood between Suarez and the Martinez family. Except for when it comes to Yolanda. Now, Yolanda will testify later at trial that there was uh, two instances that Suarez would make her feel uncomfortable. And I and I want to put uncomfortable in kind of air quotes because what she describes, what I think, would make anybody feel uncomfortable and could be looked at as like a, a form of assault. The first was at a family gathering when he grabbed her waist and she tells him to stop. He responds that he's not going to stop. And he responds that he was not going to do anything, and he ends up letting her go. So that's, that's instance one. She then, at that point, turns around and kind of slaps him. This time, though, she doesn't tell anybody about the incident. And from her description, it sounds a lot more, and I guess the, the, the tone is a lot more than, it's not just something that like he grabbed her or touched her. It seems like when she describes it, that he grabs her around the waist and kind of pulls in. She not tells him to knock it off. And he says, well, I wasn't going to do anything anyway, like trying to play it off. And then she slugs him. Later, he is going to grab her again at another kind of family get-together. This time around the waist, and he touches her ribs so this is like he grabs her around the waist again and then he kind of like you know it sounds almost like like trying to feel her up or or grab her or pull her in this time she tells jose her husband there would be some trouble between the two sides of the family for a bit she doesn't go into more than that uh, when she testifies it just seems like jose confronts suarez tells him to knock it off he doesn't want to obviously doesn't want him touching his wife um, and, and there's some animosity. It seems like the, the families don't necessarily uh, talk as much. She will say, though, that both sides will get past that and that for a while, everything seemed fine. Now, this takes us to Sunday, July 12th, 1998. The Martinez family will arrive at the Parnell Ranch somewhere between 4 o'clock and 4.30 in the afternoon. Jose was wearing a watch and Juan had a gold chain. Both men had their wallets that held their cash and IDs. Yolanda was wearing green shorts, a white shirt, and tennis shoes. Initially, when they pulled up to the trailer, they did not see Suarez. They would park, and Yolanda would go out to the trailer to get some soap. Like I said before, Suarez lives in kind of a a mobile home type trailer on, on a section of the ranch that's a ways away from the main ranch house and barn area. Now, they had intended to wash the car before Suarez had to take it to Sacramento on Monday. When she returned from the trailer with the soap, she saw Suarez and Jose walking together towards the car. Before washing the car, Jose wanted to fix an issue that the car had been having. Uh, there was no detail about what the, what the issue was, but it seemed like it was, a, it was a, something minor that he could fix kind of on the fly. So he starts, Jose starts to work on the car. Suarez is kind of sitting behind him, kind of looking on. In fact, at one point, Suarez actually pulls out a knife and hands it to Jose to to, to, to use as kind of a pry pry rod to fix something in the engine. Uh, At this point, Yolanda is playing with the kids in the yard, kind of looking on. Again, it's a lazy Saturday afternoon in summer. Um, The weather is relatively mild and nice. And eventually, Yolanda and the kids start to wash the car. Uh, when they get done, Jose, Juan, and Suarez start walking off into the field, leaving her and the children in the yard by the trailer. While the men were gone, Yolanda finishes washing the car, and she returns into the trailer. She would see through a window that the men were in the field still talking for a while. Eventually, Suarez returns to the trailer and asks for the keys to the car and says that that he's going to go to the local store 
and grabs some food, some drinks, and some snacks and asks Yolanda if she wants anything at all. Yolanda says yes, she'd like a can of uh, iced tea and some type of chips. Suarez will change out of his pants, grab some keys, and leaves the trailer. Now, it's this is the first time that she will actually recall that she did see a firearm in the trailer. She couldn't necessarily recall exactly where it was, but she do she does remember that while he was leaving, out of the corner of her eye, she kind of caught, oh, that's that's a that's a rifle there, which again. For, uh, if you're familiar, most people in the country, it's not that wouldn't be that un, unheard of, especially if you live on a big ranch like the Parnell Ranch, you know, for shooting squirrels or coyote or whatever. So we just wrapped up our discussion about the best baseball movie of all time, Major League. Nate, favorite memorable movie coach, go. My number one draft pick, Norman Dale Hoosiers. That's a terrible pick. He's not even that good of a coach. Come on, man. Bev's Video Kingdom. When your friends aren't around to argue about movies and stupid movie-related categories, listen to us. We'll do it for you. Check us out anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Pods, Spotify, and Anchor. Suarez would leave in the car, and Yolanda and the kids would take a walk around the ranch for about the next hour and a half. Eventually, Suarez will return with chips, a tea drink, and some beer. At this point, she asks, like, where are her husband and her brother-in-law? Where are Jose and Juan? Suarez would tell her that they were actually down uh, in some brush, cleaning and cutting up a deer that he'd killed earlier. Suarez would ask Yolanda for some tinfoil to wrap up some of the meat, and that they were gonna, uh, that he was gonna go back out. He was gonna help him finish cleaning the deer carcass and then bring some of the meat back. She goes back into the, she goes, kind of goes back into the kitchen area, grabs a tinfoil, and at this point, Suarez turns on a Nintendo for the kids to play with. Yolanda goes outside, gives them the tinfoil, goes outside and kind of sits in the yard while the kids are playing. As she sat there relaxing as evening approached, Suarez will storm out of the trailer, looping a rope around her throat. He pulls her back into the trailer. Yolanda would testify later at trial that she would hear her five-year-old son Jake screaming, Quote, don't hit my mommy, unquote, while his little three-year-old sister would cling to her brother for support and protection while their mother was being attacked. Then everything would go black as Yolanda would lose consciousness. Once Suarez had dragged Yolanda back into the trailer, he would put a chain around her neck and tie her wrists behind her back as well as tie her feet together. When she would eventually regain consciousness, she would be lying on the floor on her back. Suarez standing over her, cutting off her shorts and underwear with a pair of scissors. He would rape her, all the while saying, quote, Since you didn't want to willingly, now you're going to get fucked up. Unquote. She screamed for her husband, but there was no response. She would testify at trial that all the while she would not hear her children at all during this rape. When he had finished, he would tie her to something heavy in the trailer before leaving and coming back. She would lapse in and out of consciousness during this time. He would tell her not to move or else she would get strangled. Using a handkerchief and some duct tape, he would gag her, then turn the radio on loud and he would leave the trailer again. Again, she would fall unconscious. Eventually, she would regain some of her faculty. While he was gone, she would work to untie herself. With most of her clothes cut off, she would reach for a knife now, at this point, and I, this is, to me, what's absolutely astounding that she had the presence of mind to do this after all this is going on. She actually leaves the radio on because in her mind, she'll say that she thought that Suarez used the radio as a way of knowing that she's still in there. If the radio is on, then I know that she's still unconscious. So she, in her presence of mind, says, I'm, I, I'll grab a knife. She, she unties herself, cuts the bonds, takes the gag off. Again, remember, most of her clothes are cut off. She leaves the radio on because she's afraid that if he's listening, that would alert him. She sneaks out of the trailer and heads to the main house of the Parnell Ranch. There she would find Dorothy Parnell, Jack Parnell's wife, who would let her into the house and call 911. This is 9.15 at night. So this is approximately around five hours after the, the family first arrived at the Parnell Ranch. Dorothy Parnell is calling 911 about this assault. That had to be a lot 
because it has to be also really dark outside. So she can't see anything. I mean, they're on this ranch and she's going towards a direction she thinks the main house is in. I just, I can't even imagine. I, I can't either. And aside from the fact that at this point, all she knows is the last time she heard her, her children, they were screaming after the, trying to fight off the man who was raping her. She has no idea where her children are. She has no idea where her brother-in-law is. She has no idea where her husband is. And she has no idea where, where Suarez is. But she knows where the house is. And so that's that's where she she sees it to run. Law enforcement arrives at the Parnell Ranch shortly after the call. They would be confronted by Yolanda Martinez, who was covered in blood at this point, wearing a shirt and underwear that Dorothy had provided her uh, with a bandana around her neck. She was wearing a sock and a tennis shoe on one foot. There was still a cord tied around her ankle. She still wore the cut-up parts of her underwear around her waist. She had rope marks on her ankles, wrists, and throat. She had duct tape in her hair and wrapped around her neck. Her face and lips were swollen and covered in dried blood. There was also blood coming out of her right ear, as well as a mass of abrasions, bruises, and discolorations around her eyes. As soon as she saw the police, she would continue to repeat over and over again, Arturo bad in English and would begin to describe her attack at the hands of Suarez. Now, the issue is, Yolanda is not fluent in, in English. So, she begins to describe her, her attack in Spanish, but the officers that were called to the scene are not fluent in Spanish. So, and this is again, kind of an amazing thing is, the police officers call dispatch. They have a dispatch officer that does speak Spanish. So, Yolanda is describing this attack over the phone to the dispatcher, the dispatcher then has to relay that to the officers on on the scene into English. So they're so I can only imagine from an officer's perspective trying to help as much as possible, but not being able to communicate with a victim. And the frustration from from Yolanda's standpoint of I've had the worst thing possible that I can imagine happen to me currently, and I can't communicate to the people that are trying to help. Right. And also it's probably, I mean, it's 1998. So Yolanda's on a landline because cell phones aren't really, unless you have the giant, massive, crazy old cell phones, but you'd probably be on a landline. And then the dispatcher might be trying to communicate through the radio of the police, which is already just a really hard to hear anyway. Like, Right, and it sounds like actually they weren't actually on a phone. They're actually, and I'm, and if I'm said to him, I, that's my mistake. It sounds like from the police's description is that they're over the police radio. Oh, okay. So not only do you have that, like you have the like the walk, like we've seen them in movie, like the push to talk walkie talkie, and um, like you said, there's not really cell ninety eight cell phones really aren't a thing yet, not to this extent, and certainly the service at a place like the Parnell Ranch would not be good. So these officers are actually really using their radios to talk back and forth. Right. I think what's really amazing here is she's been attacked. She doesn't know what's happened to her family. She's experienced this huge trauma um, and her brain and her whole body are going through all of the, the things we've talked about before when it happened with trauma. And I know one of the things police and detectives have gotten really good at doing is helping to kind of calm a victim down so that mm-hmm. they can get the information that they need. And I would imagine in this situation, that's even more difficult, if not impossible, to do because you can't communicate with the person and she's trying to tell them this information. It just it has to be just a lot for her. And we'll we'll talk about this kind of as we go along in, in as we d- describe kind of what Yolanda goes through. But it it also speaks not to only to the character of the police officers that are trying to do this, but also to Dorothy Parnell. And, you know, it's nine o'clock at night and you live on a ranch kind of in the middle of nowhere. And I don't and I know if you're familiar with, you know, rural parts, I, I grew up kind of in, in some rural places. And I remember like going to my my dad's place which was kind of in the middle of nowhere. If some car rolls up at nine fifteen at night, or somebody comes to the door, your immediate response is, "I don't know this person. What are they doing?" But Dorothy opens her door and helps the woman. So that that kind of like you know, there's more than just the police. You have you have somebody else who's trying to help this person. Was she home alone? 
Actually, that's a good question. I I went and tried to find where were, where was Jack, and we'll actually talk about kind of their experiences later. They're actually Jack and his son are also called to testify at the trial. There's no mention of them in the initial uh, reports of like where they are. So I'm assuming that they may have went away for that day, may either on business somewhere or could have been away from home or or what. But there's no mention that 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 either Jack Parnell or his son were anywhere near that during that time. And sheriffs actually get here pretty quickly. Yeah, it's so it, by 930, deputies Mark Reed and Kurt Walk would enter the Suarez trailer. So this is like they call it 915. By 930, the sheriff's deputies are already at the scene and investigating this the, the crime. Now, again, for those of you that might be listening to this and don't have a familiarity with how like sheriffs operate, we've talked about this a little bit. We talked, um, in fact, if you've listened to our Houston episodes, we talked a lot about how um, in rural parts of California, the sheriff's department is responsible for p- policing, um, but they don't necessarily, in some cases, like where I grew up, when you called the sheriff's department, it could be 30, 45 minutes before they show up. The fact that they were here really qu- quickly is a kind of a testament to the, the Auburn sheriffs, but also the seriousness of what they, you know, when a sheriff's called and it's an emergency, it's not like they'll get there. As I said, uh, 9.30, deputies Mark Reed and Kurt Walker enter the Suarez trailer to look for him and begin to assess the crime scene. So as of now, they're looking at it as it's an active crime scene. All they know is that Yolanda's been raped, we have a missing person, and it's an active crime scene because the person that she identifies as the perpetrator isn't there. Suarez is nowhere to be found. Reed would locate a twenty two rifle as well as a thirty out 6 the 22 was loaded and there was ammunition for a 30 out 6 in the in the trailer. At 11:45, Detective William Summers and Deputy Randy Owens would enter the scene and begin to collect evidence that would be needed in in this case, as well as looking for any identifying information that could lead investigators to Suarez's whereabouts. So this is going on 2-3 hours later, they're still looking for information and I think this is really cool too because it's a part that we you know, sometimes it gets glossed over when we were reading some of these cases, but it's the investigative work that they're doing. These officers are already thinking about like, when we catch this guy, we need this evidence. So they're going through the proper things of we we're collecting evidence. We're looking for stuff. We're trying to find now, again, they're looking at it as it's an, the person is missing. We don't know where this is. We're not jumping to conclusions. So we have to find out first off where Suarez is whereabouts. Now, with an eyewitness to her attack, as well as four missing persons, two of which are small children, the police are going to do everything that they can to find uh, Suarez and, and the missing persons. And really, the, the officers talk a lot about this when they're, when they're interviewed by the newspapers, is that that was, in their mind, that's the forefront. Are there are two missing men, two missing children, and a violent offender out there somewhere. We need to find them. Now, it's here that I want to jump ahead a bit to the next day. It's the next morning that Yolanda will actually return to the ranch with police. So we're going on 12 hours. She has no idea what happened to her children. She has no idea what happened to her husband or her brother-in-law. And the police will actually bring her back to the site of her attack. They would take her to the scene. The authorities are asking her as best as they can what she saw, if she noticed anything to help them, they're they're walking her around the scene, trying everything they can do to locate her family and track down where Suarez is. Now, she does notice that there is a piece of broken wood in the front of the uh, trailer that had not been there the day before when she left. Later that afternoon, Detective Desiree Carrington searches the trailer pursuant to a warrant. So at this point, they come back in. Detective Carrington actually has a warrant from a judge. The reason why I point that out is there's some of the stuff will be brought up in trial, and I, I, I kind of want you to hold on to some of these details. Outside the trailer, uh, Detective Carrington will find three expended 22 castings. In the screened-in port, she finds a silver chain, a roll of plastic wrap inside of an aluminum tinfoil box. She finds more foil, a pair of scissors. Inside the trailer, she actually sees a black wallet, a white tennis shoe, more duct tape, more boxes of ammunition. There are a pair of boots underneath a bed, and inside the boots were three metal chains, a watch, two wallets, both containing the identifications of Jose and Juan Martinez, 
collectively $147 in U.S. currency and $80 in Mexican pesos. Now, these items did not have any dirt on them. The clasps on the chains were still intact and undamaged, which is t it, it will be telling to the detectives. Eventually, some more duct tape would be found with dark strands of hair in them. There'd also be faint tire tracks that would lead towards a set of blackberry bushes that were off in the distance. At this time, search dogs were, would be brought in, and searchers would come across a man-made opening in this set of blackberry bushes with some sticks and wood placed in front of it. Now, this was about a quarter of a mile away from the trailer. The sheriff's deputies will actually go on record as saying that this did not look like somebody was actually trying to hide it. When they get there, once they, they kind of follow the trail and use the dogs, they get up to this, almost instantly all of the, the investigators there are like, yeah, somebody, somebody did this ahead of time. You know, it's not, it's not like a hastily you know, created thing. It's also not like somebody put bushes in front of this. It's, it looks like somebody cut a space out of these bushes and just put like kind of a plywood plank and some debris in front of it. Uh, it was here in the, at this space that they would find signs of a freshly moved dirt. There were, however, no blood trails. There would be a blood-splattered square-nosed shovel with a handle uh, and a round-nosed shovel nearby. It was there that we'd discover a makeshift grave along this, these poorly hidden space in the berries. The makeshift grave was somewhere between 5.5 feet to 6 feet in length and around 2 feet in width no more than three feet in depth. Its walls were cut smoothly at a 90-degree angle. An excavation team was actually brought in to check out the area. They found a child's leg only 19 inches in the dirt. They found Jake's body lying face down. The second body, that of Ariel, was lying face up with a stick in her hand and her mouth open, covered with dirt. The third body, Jose, was lying face up with his legs and his arms outstretched, his left arm crossed over his chest. The final body, Juan, also found was lying face up with his legs outstretched and his hands crossed over his chest. At the bottom, they found an expended 22 casing as well as blood stains. Eventually, Dr. Donald Henriksen would perform the autopsies on the bodies of the Martinez family. Jake Martinez would have a depressed skull fracture and linear fractures extending from the base of the skull, contusions and abrasions on his face, back, and wrist, as well as bruising on his shoulders, chest, and soft tissue area near his skull. He had the residue of tape around his mouth, arms, and legs. His mouth, throat, and lungs were full of dirt. He was hit at least once in the back and eight times on his head. The doctor would state that his injuries were consistent with a tubular instrument, such as the handle of a shovel. The doctor would go on to say that this blunt force trauma would not be enough to kill him. It would have rendered him unconscious, but not kill him. He would declare the cause of death to be asphyxiation by obstruction to the airway due to aspiration of foreign material. This means that after fighting to protect his mother and three-year-old sister, Jake was beaten and hit with a shovel, but what killed him was being buried alive. Ariel had three fractures in her skull, hematoma over both sides of her head, and contusions and abrasions on her face, head, torso, both arms, and both legs. She held a twig in her hand, even in death. Her airways were also packed with mud and dirt. She had the same tape residue on her face that her brother would have. And like her brother, the blunt force that she took would not have been enough to kill her, but the dirt that would fill her airways would be. Jose, it was determined, was killed from two gunshots, one to the back of his head and the other to his left ear. These were both contact wounds, meaning that the gun was pushed into the body before it was fired. There was also some bruising and contusions on his back that would suggest that Jose was dragged while he was unconscious or tied at some point. These same markings would also be on Juan's body. His cause of death would be from three gunshot wounds. Again, all of these were less than an inch away from his upper right forehead. Yolanda would be examined by Kim Marama, who was a sexual assault nurse examiner. 
Her injuries would tell the story clearly of a savage beating and rape at the hands of Suarez. Yolanda had swelling, contusions, abrasions, and lacerations on her face. There would be blood in her right inner ear canal as well as blood in her right eye. There were more damage done to her neck, ankles, and wrists. Though there was no sperm found, her injuries were consistent with rape. In fact, it would later be determined that Suarez would leave her children lying on top of the bodies of their father and uncle while he returned to rape their mother as they slowly suffocated on the dirt that made up their shallow grave. We're going to stop here uh, in this part of the, the story of the Martinez family and, and their murder at the hands of Arturo Juarez Suarez. Uh, We will continue with law enforcement's search for Suarez and his flight from prosecution in the next episode of California True Crime, which will be out next week. Uh, Sean will cover our cold case for this episode. On the afternoon of August 6th, 2021, in the canal near Peaceful Valley Road, PG&E workers who were working near the canal were clearing some debris when they found the submerged body of a man. The man was partially clothed, with his feet bound together. His hands, however, were not restrained. He would be identified as James Pascal Rodriguez. Investigators say that he has been in the water for around a week before he had been found. They will also state that due to the head trauma that he suffered, they are looking into his death as a murder. He was often found in the North San Juan area of Nevada County, which is north of Nevada City along Highway 49. They are looking for any information or witnesses that might have seen James in the last week of July in 2021 that can help turn up any information that helps in this investigation. Anyone who has more information about Rodriguez or the homicide is asked to contact the Sacramento Valley Crime Stoppers at 1-800-AACRIME. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. For a full list of our sources, as well as more information on the case, head over to our webpage at californiatruecrime.com, where you can support the show by joining our Patreon, which has the option of ad-free episodes. Our web store is up and running with some new California True Crime merchandise, t-shirts, mugs, and special episode-exclusive stickers. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cali True Crime. Make sure that you're subscribed to our show to get our latest episodes. Leave us a five-star review or tell a friend to get the word out about California True Crime. We'd like to thank our quality control engineer, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at Snail Ranch Studios and The Hangar and has been a production of Way Grimace.